Egypt. So, when, when the human blinders or were they blocked when we did? No, it was. It was. Um, I was invited to meet Tom to talk about this about taboo, which was um, an idea that he and his dad had worked on. At the, while we were waiting for Tom to park his car, um, I spoke to his manager and said, would he be okay to also speak about um, an idea I had for a film, which is a one-man thing, and it's fine. So we spoke about Taboo and we spoke about Locke, and we sort of came to an informal agreement that he would do Locke and I did Taboo. So that's how it began. The Locke came out of this? Yes, exactly. The meeting was about this, yeah. Yeah. So the two are related. No, I mean, it also, I mean, the idea was great. I, I love the um, the possibilities of what this idea had, which was that um, a, an adventurer goes to Africa, comes back, he's done some terrible things, and then he follows his, his life. Um, and I'm, ooh, I'm really interested in that time period, 1814, which um, Britain's at war with America, Britain's at war with France, East India Company are having their monopoly taken off them by the, by the Crown. So you've got all of this conflict going on. And London being London, the capital of the world, so, such a sort of vibrant, dangerous, exciting place. You get your characters and throw them into that and see what happens. That's, that's what was so exciting. It's a very dark vision of the early Victorian age, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it and was. Did anybody who watched Victoria would not recognise it. Anybody what? Victoria. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've never seen it. So. No, I mean, I think that. Do, do, do you want to put it apart? No, no, I mean, it's not that. It's more. If you, if you. First of all, if you do research, but also if you just confront the things we all know about that period. In other words, the fact that people were hung, drawn, quartered, the fact that people were routinely hung, that there was a lot of violence, that there was a lot of poverty. Of course, that's going to look like some, you know, the acceptance of a certain level of violence, the, 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 the pre-Victorian morality, because a lot of what we call Victorian morality came as a result of reaction to things that were happening in the 1820s and 30s, where everything went to hell, and it was like the crack cocaine, gin, and so it's looking at that period and being sort of realistic about it rather than trying to make it fit into what we imagine to be the Victorian way of doing this. Because obviously this is pre-Victorian and also in a city where everything was about cash. You know, in, in, um, in this, I've sort of avoided where possible, not on purpose, but it's not about class. It's all about commerce. Everybody's, it's about money, which makes it, I think, makes it feel more modern. And also, I think, in day to day life in London, when people were doing what they did, that's how it would have felt. And I wanted to make James Delaney a sort of a precursor of the industrialists who, who followed him, who detached themselves from their church congregation, from their class, from their village, from everything, and just did stuff and made stuff and built. You know, commercial empire because they were individuals. They weren't being sponsored by anybody. They just did it themselves because of their own ingenuity and their you know, their courage. You know, and I think James Delaney's like that. He's someone who is not a loyal subject. He's not. He's an internationalist, if you like. And he decides he's going to do this. And as you'll see in, in the rest of the eight hours, that's what it's about. It's about an individual who takes on the machines or around. Him. The East India Company here is the, the, the evil. Uh, the, I, 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 I try not to, uh, as as you as you you will find out in the next eight hours. I think it's always very easy to take a big corporation and, and say they're the baddest. It's great, it's nice and easy. Nobody objects <laughs> because you know. <laughs> but but also within the East India. I think you have to see what it was and, 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 and why it was there and what it did. And I, I don't characterise it as like this evil empire at all. Because I think it's it's a product of what people wanted, what people were doing at the time. So, you know, James Delaney is no saint. 
and he takes them on. Uh, and it's probably possibly less moral, justifiable than they. Because he's uh, probably more flawed and he has the sins of the past. Uh, you can't really call him a hero, but I mean, do you think there's any links to which a lead character in the drama now cannot cannot go to still be yeah. sympathetic? Oh yeah, yeah. I think there's, there is still um, a moral compass about um, what people do. I think people. To begin with, in TV, you can have a character be unsympathetic for much longer, because you've got longer. Uh, in a feature, you can't really play around with that. But with with TV, you can take a character and really take them far and redeem. You know, it's the, the lost sheep idea that if you get someone who is redeemed at the end, the whole thing will sort of work. Uh, and I, I, no, no, I think people anti-hero is fine, but people are not really thinking it thinking of it like that. I think they feel that if this person, if they think it's a good person doing bad things for a good reason, they'll let them get away, they'll let them get away with the bad thing. Um, and I think that's hopefully what one tries to do. But of course, it's like with, with, um, with uh, Peter Blinders, the hero is the policeman. He's trying to stop people attacking each other. But it doesn't come. And, and, and but the point is that is to point to point the audience to that fact as well. And that's what in this is is what we do as well is to say, hang on a minute, this this person you that is so attractive, and this person is so unattractive. The unattractive person is trying to save people's lives. This attractive person is trying to kill people. Where does that leave you as an audience? You know what I mean? I think you have to confront. If, if he told that, gone on. Do you know? I, I saw the original poll, and I haven't seen it. I don't watch a lot of telly, so I don't know. It's the honest, honestly, I have never watched it. I've never seen it. You find with, um, you said you know about the period, um, yeah. like the War of 1812, mm. was there a lot of research to make it authentic, or do you feel this is more of a character piece? It's a, it is a character piece, but I think that you'd be a fool not to find out what was going on, because the best stuff comes from the truth of a period. I mean the real truth, not just historical, but if you just scratch the surface of, for example, um, in subsequent episodes, there's an American spy based on a real American spy who was also a surgeon who was also researching the dyeing of cotton with colours and trying to find the best sort of dye that would work best to dye sheets of cotton. So there's three things that if you're creating a visual character, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't dare do that. But if you find that for real, you put it in and just go, that, you know, that's the, that's the madness of reality. Yeah. But was it quite a fluid process um, in terms of writing? Were there things that you thought, oh, here, but then I'll move it um, oh, down the lane, even to like another series? Were there things that like, you pre-fished? Not, not so much in the series, but within the, the eight hours, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to. And I try to be open to unexpected things happening on the page so that if something happens, you weren't expecting it. You then reverse engineer to make that okay because the the authority I think should always go with what came most recently. And it does mean that you, you do have to go back, so you do have to move things around. I know you say you don't watch much television in terms of the uh, uh, right for television and for blogs. Um, almost a technical question, but also a moral one. You use the N word in it and the F word. I that's up to the BBC, but I mean I think that if if um, if you're being true to the time uh, uh, to how people mm. spoke, then you are. If you're understandably sensitive about it, I wouldn't object if they dropped that word. If you, you know, it's not like we must do. That. It's simply that's what that's what people used to say, and I think the the, the, the character who says it, the reflection is on that character because of that work. So, was there any consideration because uh, it's going on BBC and FX? Was mm. that something that you know created in your mind? You said not, two different audiences. Were not really. I mean, because FX were great, they didn't interfere at all. They didn't have input or didn't want to have input on the script so it didn't feel that there was any pressure from an executive level to do things but 
um, I mean, you, it's a story of someone who is dealing with the British and the American government. So there is going to be a perception on both sides of the matter. But I think if you start worrying about that, it, it's difficult. You make life difficult for yourself. Does it surprise you if it will be shown on Saturday night from deep to I mean, I think that the lesson that I think what's happening in television is a, a revolution. And it's sort of a golden age. I mean, I think that the way television has changed in the past 10, 15 years is incredible, mostly driven by contemporary American and British period. I think, you know, that those two things have really blossomed. I think it's underestimated that people have got better televisions now. They've got big screens, so it's worth it. What's the, when you used to have them bulbous little televisions, what was the point of, of going to all that trouble to make it look beautiful? But now, like, when it's on the screen, it looks like cinema. So, lots of things have conspired together to make what's possible on TV. And, of course, the, the, the new cheapness of special effects, which is great, means that what's possible on TV has is, is changed radically. So, therefore, when you've got more scope, I think it brings different sort of people in. And I think that, you know, in this, something that I'm not, that I don't think is a fantastic development, the fact that people can watch virtually anything on the internet and they think they've got access to all sorts of stuff. It's like, I love, I mean, I think the BBC um, has to move with the time and it has to move with its audience. So I think that, you know, it, no one's suggesting we should have a cosy view of the past. However, a cosy view of the past is fine. It's absolutely fine to do because it's entertaining and it's good and people like it and families watch it. I think that's fantastic. But there is also room for a different view of the past. Do you know what I mean? That, that it doesn't mean one replaces the other. And I think that you know, all of the evocations of the past that are um, probably less challenging are great. I have no problem with them at all. I think they're great and, and difficult to do. That's the thing. You know, I've worked in commercial television before going into film and people think that making something that's commercial and popular and fun for all the family is easy and it isn't. It's the most difficult. Um, yeah, it's the most difficult. Because you, you don't have you don't have little tricks that you can do. You know, the big audience spots it. And that's why I think anything that gets that big audience, the big commercial things, it's really difficult to do. But this feels like a sort of like Peaky Blinders, a kind of box set feel about it that you might want to sit down and have them watch a few of them. Yeah, I, I think people will, and, and that's the thing about the audience. The audience has changed the way that it watches telly, and the, the proportion of people who will watch this on Saturday night at whatever time it goes out will be small compared to the number of people who will eventually see somewhere else in the box. And I think it's um, it's a very odd phenomenon that I don't understand. It's the the fierce loyalty of the box set generation to their thing. You don't get it with feature films. You don't get people going, you've got to watch this, you've got to watch this. You know, with all that great American stuff, Mad Men, all that, people were real evangelists for that thing. I don't understand why, but I think people sit down and watch them, do what, binge watch them, and get a real feeling for that. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully this is what people are doing. But do you find that um, now that people tend to binge watch stuff more so, that writing each episode becomes different because you can like, Usually you get yeah. what, what happens next, yeah. but when people binge watch it, they yeah. get the gratification. <laughs> yeah, I think that it, it's um, it's a sort of obligation to leave each episode with a hook to try and bring people back because that's just commercial sense. You, know, you want people to, to follow up, but I think you do have to be aware that someone's going to find out a few minutes later when they're watching it. I mean, the the, the the, ma the person who did it and did it well was Dickens, who would seri everything was serialised, it would end with a clip. But when you read the book, you don't think, oh, what's that? Why is that? We, 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 we've been reading. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, that's that's the template, I suppose, for all, for all stuff. Are you planning uh, to write more for Tom? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.